Hi everyone, I'm Shreya. I am a PhD student at the UC Berkeley Rice Lab. Um, and I'm here to talk about monitoring ML in real time, especially when you have feedback delays. What are the challenges in doing so? Um, and how do we get there? So to get started, um, I'll first be kind of motivating why dealing with ML pipeline sucks. What can we do about it? Which all of you are very, very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, where are we kind of when it comes to observability for ML? Very much a theme of this conference. Um, and then more into the challenges that I alluded to earlier, um, talking a little bit about data shift, what that means, and then kind of solution ideas to how do we know how well our models are performing pretty accurately um, and in real time. Uh, so yeah, dealing with ML pipelines sucks as everybody pretty much knows kind of you have these pipelines that are made up of multiple components and each component you can um, take from your pick right of like 200 different tools. Um, and so the technical stack is complex. It's highly customized per organization. Um, there's a separation between an online and offline component and sorry online and offline stage in many, many organizations. Um, and this is just such a hassle. Any on-call ML engineer or data scientist, it's their biggest nightmare. Um, and in addition to this complex technical stack, right, a lot of problems can come up post-deployment. Um, these are the ones that I have seen like on the fly all the time in my previous job, like corrupted upstream data, data not meeting its SLAs. Um, the model developers on leave and then a customer complains about the prediction quality. Um, somebody made some assumptions at training time that don't quite hold an inference time. Data, quote unquote, drifts over time. Nobody really knows what that means or how to flag that. Um, like a class of silent failures that come up in ML systems um, and then more. So motivating, like, why do we need observability, right? It's like, especially in the ML case, it's super impractical to try to catch all of the bugs before they happen. Um, but when we find some sort of bug or we think that there's a bug in an ML system, we would like to be able to minimize the downtime somehow. Um, so when thinking about building observability for ML systems, whether that's that you're an ML engineer at your company or you're thinking about building ML tools, um, you want to, one, help engineers detect bugs pretty accurate, accurately. Um, and then when you know that there, when they know that there's a bug, right, you want to help engineers diagnose the bug. So why is there this bug? Where is it in the pipeline? And then how do I fix it? Um, and why is this hard, right? You have this wide variety of skill sets, um, multiple different stakeholders in the pipeline, especially people who didn't build the end-to-end -end pipeline, engineers, data scientists, product managers, whatsoever. Um, and how do we kind of build tooling and interface to fit all of these needs? Um, please, yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I know I'm kind of blazing through these slides. Um, so, so what is the current state of affairs kind of looking like? And I, I'm sitting there happily divorced in my PhD land in academia. So I, I'm sure you guys are more up to date for what's going on. Um, but the way that we kind of have it in academia is there are multiple types of ML data management solutions. Um, that have come up over the last few years in these conferences. Um, one around kind of pre-training. So what do I need to start training a model? So maybe that's like feature stores, ETL pipelining. How do I materialize um, the inputs that I want to give to my data scientists so that they can train models? Um, the second class I think of ML data management solutions also that are like incredibly popular um, is I'm running a bunch of experiments to try to select the best model for a pipeline. How do I select the best model? How do I convince other stakeholders that this model right here is the best model? And we've got tools like MLflow, weights and biases, um, whatsoever. And then there's this largely like new class, I think, of data management solutions that are being explored, especially when uh, people in industry are deploying more and more models. Um, so what does it mean to do performance monitoring? What is it like to come up with um, debugging interfaces for production models what is the equivalent of the prometheus um, or like cool open source tools um, to i don't know debug what's going on um and what i see kind of in um, academia and even in industry a lot of people talk about observability for ml um without really defining it so i'll try to define it here shamefully stolen from um, charity majors from honeycomb which is the power to ask new questions of your system without having to ship new code or gather new data. Um, so what does that mean and kind of how is that different from monitoring in a nutshell? 
Um, you want to log some raw st structured data at every component of your end-to-end -end pipeline so that people can query it afterwards to debug. Um, and monitoring, uh, she says, or uh, they say in your uh, blog post is that monitoring is around known unknowns and actionable alerts. Um, so maybe that's like, how do we monitor the perform? Well, how do we monitor the accuracy of our models? And then observability is kind of like, what are the unknown unknowns, the things that we didn't try to monitor uh, beforehand? Um, how can we ask new questions? So in a concrete ML case, right? Suppose I, I have this ML task. I'm doing like a binary classification problem, and all of a sudden I start seeing class imbalance. Um, how do I have the power to now like uh, measure the F1 score in addition to accuracy when I didn't define upfront that I wanted to be tracking F F1 score over time, right? And like this can be a complex aggregation depending on where your predictions and labels are stored, if they're even logged at all. Um, how do we make this super easy for people? Um, all super open questions, I think, in ML observability land. Um, and so where are we now? Uh, maybe this is like a very gruesome state of the affairs, but we have very imprecise definitions and a lot of alert fatigue for model performance, right? Everybody's monitoring their like mean, median, uh, P75, P99 feature values and output values. Um, these are imprecise definitions of model quality, right? We don't have precise definitions. We know we want to measure accuracy. Um, or we know we want to measure F1 score, but we're unable to do this in real time, maybe because of feedback delay, a label lag or something like that. Um, and we want some observability system to tell us accurately, oh, when do we retrain our models or when something is broken, right? Like when I was at my previous company and I was monitoring uh, the P99 for every single out feature value, um, I would get alerts all the time and this was completely unnecessary. Uh, and I never listened to them, right? So how do we kind of reduce that fatigue? Um, and interface wise, right, like we, we have all these beautiful dashboards, right, of like hundreds of graphs. If we want to see our feature values over time, we want to see our KL divergences over time. That's amazing and great. But at the end of the day, are they actionable? Don't really know. Um, do we even look at end to end? Do we and one single person kind of look at the entire end to end data pipeline, which has the ML transformation in it um, and see kind of what's going on? Uh, very few organizations that I've talked to, I definitely did not have this at my previous company. Um, and then of course, like the post hoc ability to query um, and aggregate structured logs, right, of what's going on in the pipeline. Um, we, we didn't have this. Um, Prometheus is a like great example of thinking about like, what does it mean to query post hoc uh, for um, things that metrics that we care about. Um, so in defining a North Star, at least like my, my research thinks a lot about this, um, and I'm sure like lots of companies are also working on this, of course. Um, we want some sort of like, we, we want the user to both have high flexibility as well as abstract away all the data management, the nitty gritty data management for them. Um, so maybe that's like allowing them to have custom um, Python based metric definitions, uh, like a custom loss function or something that they want to track in real time. And we also maybe can have a library of predefined Python based metric definitions. Um, we also need to account for the fact that predictions are made separately from labels um, or feedback. And maybe these are in two different streams or two different tables or whatnot. But the point is that a lot of these metrics defined in this first bullet point require some joins over multiple streams, right? Um, and we need to do this, especially when there's a lag um, in between the predictions being generated and the labels coming in. Um, automatic logging of raw events throughout a pipeline, right? Again, like because the tech stack is like pretty complex and diverse, uh, how do we make like, I don't know, a tool, how, how do we make a tool that interoperate is interoperable with the uh, highly customizable end-to-end? -end? Um, and then of course, the last thing is how do you have some sort of querying interface for, our, for the logs? Um, and I have like a pretty, uh, verbose SQL query here, which maybe I shouldn't have included, but something like I want to see um, all of my metric names and values um, for the past month. I don't know. Um, and in this talk specifically, I'll be focusing on the second bullet point here. So multiple stream maintenance. Um, what does it mean to do like ML performance monitoring or metric monitoring um, with the feedback delays? So to give you a little bit of a background, right, like why is this hard? We don't always have labels in real time. Um, and in a lot of the times, right, labeling is done in batch. So um, like, for example, 
an organization will make a bunch of predictions um, and then humans might annotate them at the end of every month or at the end of every quarter cycle um, based on some, I don't know, business, uh, business metric. Um, and so these labels are not always available post deployment, but we don't want to wait till the end of the cycle to figure out how something as simple as how well our model is doing. Um, and when we see like performance drops um, in the model, right, it, it's very easy to get caught up in the like nitty gritty variation of model performance. Is the performance drop temporary? Um, a lot of models don't do well on weekends, but do well on weekdays. Um, or is the performance drop forever? Um, then there's also like in the case of recommender systems, right, we have degenerate feedback loops. So I've made a prediction that influences the user's action, and then that's making another prediction. Um, and so forth, right? So I've like led the user down a rabbit hole, but I still kind of want to know how my model is doing compared to some previous model that I could have put out there, right? Um, so like, like what? How do I even think of monitoring all of these things? Um, and I, I think at least from doing like interview studies and talking to people, and even in my previous company, my experience, um, there there's levels of sophistication for people tracking kind of how their data is changing over time and how that impacts the model. Um, as a proxy for knowing like your model accuracy or the uh, business metric that you care about. And so the straw man approach is kind of like, I want to track the means and the quantiles of the features and outputs. Uh, it works maybe for some cases, it has never worked for me. I've always slept through all of my alerts. Um, and then there's like a, I took a stats class um, approach where now I'm going to track all of these like KS, chi-squared test statistics, um, and whatsoever, because maybe I like read a medium post and that's what they told me to do. Um, or I, somebody told me that if something is statistically significant, then I need to retrain my model. Um, and there's like very cool open source packages for this. Um, but both approaches are label unaware. Um, they don't use all the information we have. Um, and in the like K, in the p-value case, right, if we are making like hundreds of thousands of predictions, which is super reasonable to even make like across a month um just like comparing the cdfs of two distributions will uh, be quote unquote statistically significant um so can we the idea here um is can we use can, can we estimate the performance of our model instead of relying on these uh methods for tackling shift um or tracking shift um to do this in this talk i have like a toy task um so it's a binary classification task where we predict whether a passenger in a taxi ride will give a driver a reasonable tip. Uh, a reasonable is in quotes 10%. And it uses public data, we use like a random forest classifier. This is not like the, the point of this talk is not like how do we have good models, but like how do we evaluate accuracy when you might not have um, your labels coming in in real time. And to give like an illustration of what that means, I know this figure is a little bit complicated, but the pipeline is kind of the top half of the figure. Um, and the, suppose we have like inference or like predictions tables, and we have a feedback table, which is the labels. And so at time one, two, and five, we generate predictions. Um, and at time, at time three, four, and six, we get some uh, labels for the IDs that we've made predictions for. Um, at time, what, at time two, right, we have made two predictions, but we don't have feedback for each one of these. So we don't really know like how well our model is doing. It's a question mark when it comes to accuracy. At time t equals three, now I have some partial feedback, some partial visibility into the performance of my model. Um, I see that the first predictions label is one. I got the first prediction right. So now my accuracy is 100%, great. T equals four, same thing, my accuracy is 100%. At T equals four, I've gotten everything, I had my full feedback, this is this is the great great case. Um, but again, right, as we make another prediction at T equals five, we don't know how our model is doing because we're missing some feedback. T equals six, we get it again. Um, but the point is like, once we make the three predictions, the first three predictions, as soon as we make a prediction, we would like to know how well, or estimate how well our model is doing. Right. Um, so maybe we can react to that. And this is such a contrived example. In a lot of cases, you can have like weeks to months of lag, like credit card fraud, for example. Um, you can have months of delays for your feedback. Right. So how do you um, how do we estimate something in the question marks here or even in the partial feedback case? How do we create a tighter estimate of the accuracy? Um, I'm going to actually skip these slides. Um, 
actually, no, no, I'll go through them. Um, as a small tangent, but I have a separate side hobby of uh, trying to convince people that the terminology of the data shift is not quite what we care about. Um, there's there's so many different types of data shift out there, and people kind of get uh, bogged down in these definitions of like covariate shift, label shift, data shift, uh, prior probability shift, label shift. I may have already said that. Um, but the but the only reason that we care about them is because we probably want to change our training set in some way um, to retrain our model automatically or kind of get our performance back up. Um, but I'll, I'll define them a little bit and then it's relation to this feedback delay problem. Um, but talking a little bit about the shift, right? Like there, I'll, so if you, if you think about it, our model has an X, which is the features, and then it's trying to predict some Y. Um, y hat, if you've taken an ML class, um, Y is like the true label. And so P of Y just means a distribution of labels. P of X is the distribution of features. P of Y given X means is, is what an ML model is trying to learn. Given some features, what is the prediction? Um, so you can have like different types of shift based on how these distributions are changing, right? So if your P of Y given X is the same. So for example, the model, the relationship between your features and outputs is the same but maybe your proportions of features change, um, then you have covariate shift. And then concept shift is maybe your P of Y given X is changing, um, but your P of X is the same. So I have the same kind of distributions of features, but something happens in the world and now I need to retrain my model. Um, and the, the point I wanna make here is that any other shift is encompassed by Bayes rule, right? We, we know this via Bayes rule. So people will say like, oh, there's like a P of X given Y shift, or there's like, it, that's fine, right? Like you have this equation, some of these numbers will change. Um, it doesn't matter what the definition of the shift is. All that matters is um, when you have, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but concept shift, for example, will require you to retrain your model, right? Covariate shift. Um, you can you might be able to anticipate covariate shift based on the representation of X in your training set and your inference set and just different different sorry diffing that um, and some examples uh, in the New York City taxi cab case uh, covariate shift is maybe there's more taxi rides in Midtown around New Year's Eve where Midtown is a location in New York and then concept shift could be uh, we've got some like heavy construction in certain areas and that changes and when people tip less when they're sitting in their taxi cab for longer i don't know um, and that kind of requires some retrain to be up to speed about what is what um the construction areas are uh, so do we do care about the terminology i don't really know why we do but we do care about how the implication or how we, we care about the shift in terms of how it requires us to change our training set um, towards like, I don't know, self-augmenting training sets in the future. Okay, so we've talked about shift. Um, we have talked about these like feedback delays. Um, so how do we mesh these together? Well, given these like practical problems of like data shift in the wild, we don't have feedback um, that comes on time. How can we estimate the performance of our model? Um, so I break it down in my most recent VLDB submission um, into coarse grained and fine grained monitoring. Maybe I should change these terms actually, but the idea is that one, we want to be able to detect performance issues. And then two, we want to be able to diagnose the performance issues. Um, and diagnosis will require more fine grained monitoring and logging. Maybe that's the KS test statistics or KL divergences that we care about, but we don't want to rely specifically on fine grained things. Um, because then we could get alert fatigue. Um, it doesn't fully accurately represent the higher level coarse grain accuracy um, that we care about. Um, so in detecting these performance issues, um, we have three cases in the paper. Like we have a full feedback case, uh, partial feedback, and no, or full feedback, no feedback, partial feedback. So full feedback is I, at some point in time, I've got all the labels for all of my predictions. Excellent, great, super simple. I do a join between the predictions and the labels. I compute the accuracy or I compute I, the metric that we care about in this example is accuracy. So I compute the accuracy on my result. Um, and then I just do this repeatedly, right? But this is expensive computationally, depending on my window size or how frequently I want to compute it based on how many predictions I've made. Um, what if my data becomes too large to fit into memory? And I, I don't know, what do I do then? 
right? Um, so a lot of people in try to solve this problem by let's do a batch offline monitoring job. I will write a Spark job that uh, maybe every day, at the end of every day or so, um, joins my predictions and feedback and then kind of like computes the accuracy and then produces some Jupyter notebook of results, something like that. Um, that's cool. It's great. Maybe that requires full time engineer could be could take a long time. I don't know. But but we could also think about like existing data management or databases techniques to compute this with um, approximate this right approximate query processing exists. Um, so in our paper, we talk about we you can keep like a reservoir sample of predictions made so far um, and you can do this like in a streaming fashion. Um, and then vacate the slot when a label comes in. Um, and what we do is we, we can incrementally maintain some measure of accuracy um, as over time. Um, and what are the challenges with this that we're actively trying to fight? Well, um, practically, right, like labels might never come in for predictions. So uh, if we have predictions in the reservoir that never have labels that ever come in, we still need to expire them somehow um, and then adjust the estimate accordingly. I don't know. Um, and then another thing is that labels come in batch a lot of times. So um, practically the reservoir will just experience, a lot of the slots will just vanish or become vacant um, every like month or so whenever the labels come in. Um, so what that means is as soon as a bunch of labels come in, um, there's higher probability of the immediately next predictions coming into the reservoir sample. So how do we like think about, I don't know, um, making sure that every prediction is equally likely to fall in the reservoir sample? Um, OK, so in the no feedback case, so that was a full feedback case, the easy case. Uh, we join the predictions on the labels, and we call it a day. This is the worst case, which is we've got no labels. Maybe this occurs immediately after deployment. Um, and a solution here is to importance weight training accuracy. And I'll define how that goes. And this, like any organization could do like right now um, when they don't have um, labels. But the idea here is you split your train set into some bins or some buckets. So in our example, maybe that's I have this training set. I split it into buckets based on the location, the pickup location or the pickup neighborhood. Um, I create some criteria for the buckets or some, some model that like will output the bucket ID given any data point. Um, and then I determine the training accuracy for each bucket. So in our example, concretely, um, maybe I'll have accuracy for each neighborhood in New York City. Um, and so what happens at inference time? Um, so we, we, have, we, we have this feature vector right, that we get at inference time. And we put it in the bucket that it belongs to based on its location or whatever model that we choose. Um, and then whenever we want to compute the live accuracy, we look at the fraction of data points in each inference bucket. We multiply that by the training accuracy, and then we add that all up. So an example, suppose we have buckets FIDI in Midtown, they have accuracies of 80% and 50%. Cool. After deployment, we see 100 FIDI rides and 500 Midtown rides. Okay, so doing the importance weighting, we know we can multiply 80% by, by 100 and then 50% by 500. Um, and then I do, I guess I did not do this correctly because I should have divided it by the total number of rides, not 500. So I should have divided by 600. But anyways, not super embarrassing. But you can get a sense of the, how to do the estimated accuracy here. Um, you, again, weight each training accuracy by its representation at inference time um, to come up with an estimate. And so we did some experiments to kind of see how well this method did. Like, suppose you never have any labels. Um, the first, the plot on the left, um, you see kind of like the inference the histogram of locations at inference time versus in the training set, it matches. It's great. So we can kind of believe that our estimate for accuracy is going to be good. Um, but as the data shifts, as you can see on the right, um, so we look at April 2020 versus January 2020. 
um, the representation changes, right? And so maybe our my our representation, or sorry, maybe our importance weighted estimate won't be as accurate as we think it'll be. And so when we actually plot it um, here over time, so the important the, the blue line is the importance weighted estimate based on location. The orange line is the real accuracy based on the actual data. We see a huge divergence in the estimate and the real um, around COVID time, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so the challenge here in this no feedback case is how do we come up with um, good buckets that give us the, the most accurate overall approximate metric value? Uh, we need buckets with good representation in both the train and inference set similar representation or whatnot. Um, cool. And so some solution ideas, preliminary solution ideas we discussed in the paper are some like weighted combinations of training and inference sets, hierarchical aggregate summaries, I'll skip through this stuff, um, lots of hyperparameters to decide, unfortunately, the need to constantly recompute buckets. Um, so anyways, we're actively working on this, I'm super interested in it, at least for tabular data. Um, cool. And then finally, um thinking about the feed the case this is the most common case the partial feedback case where i have some labels and i have some label predictions and i have some on label predictions um and i'll i can just simply do some hybrid of the full feedback and no feedback cases um but there's an interesting the academic in me finds this interesting extra problem where some data points have longer delays than others and the delays aren't necessarily uniformly distributed like suppose you have a power outage so all of your, I don't know, credit card data comes in later, um, et cetera. So an additional interesting problem for, to uh, help engineers debug their models or debug their at least data collection streams is to identify groups of data points with similar delays and to do this in a streaming fashion, um, but separate from this ML monitoring. Okay, so um, I will breeze through the fine grain stuff because we only have a couple of minutes and I want to give at least a minute for questions. But you can think about in the coarse grain case, we have an estimate for accuracy or we have an estimate for um, the metri business metric we care about. Now, when that goes down, we can use the fine grained uh, metrics such as KL divergence or KS test statistics or whatnot to um, help, I don't know, us determine what's wrong. So maybe this is the missing data alerts, the upper and lower bounds for feature values. Um, this is tedious to scale to thousands of features. So fun research challenges, like how do you automatically detect this, right? AWS and other cloud services have like CloudWatch, for example, but I mean, they don't, they didn't work for me very well when we were scaling up. Um, and as a result, right, like practitioners push this kind of data quality verification onto the shift detection, right? Like if I have a bunch of missing data in a column um, or my upper or the bounds have changed a lot, well, then my KS test statistic will be different by definition. Um, so then interesting research problem, which is like kind of how do I separate the engineering issues of like broken data and the actual like my data has shifted, but my constraints or expectations aren't violated. Um, and idea here is look into these kind of fine grained statistics when coarse grained approximations are low. Um, okay, I'll skip this stuff and give a last like two two second pitch on kind of what I'm working on. So I'm working on ML trace. We're probably going to change the name soon, but we're thinking about like what does it mean to come up with a bolt-on observability tool to existing pipelines. Um, and I personally work on projects in like databases, ML, and HCI. Um, I will spare you from having to listen to me read every single word here. But if you're interested in working on any of these projects you're an undergrad or grad student or interested in doing research, please reach out. Um, I've linked some stuff here. I'll probably end up sharing the slides somehow, but my email is first name, last name at Berkeley. And thanks so much for your time.